I titled my talk, uh, Wasted Food for Surplus People. I'll say a little bit about that, food charity or the right to food. It engages with many of the issues that Tina and I, you know, in terms of editing the book, you know, First World Hunger Revisited, Food Charity or the Right to Food, uh, ha have, uh, have addressed, or our, our authors in 12 countries actually have addressed in, in, in the past eight, 18 months. Um, and, but I want to maybe sort of speak a little bit more about some of my own um, attitudes and views about what, what, what has been occurring in, in, in this area. And there are, re there are really three themes that, I, that, I, that I'd, I'd, I'd like to address and like to talk about. The first is really why 30 years of, of, of charitable food banking has shown itself to be part of the problem uh, and not the solution to domestic hunger or food poverty as, as, as we talk about it in the UK. Uh, in the world's richest uh, uh, food, se food secure societies. Um, and why it is, I think it's important that we understand food banking this, uh, as, as a form of uncritical solidarity. Now this is a term that's actually used by the author of the Spanish chapter here in terms of, in terms of thinking about the growth and proliferation of food banks in Spain. He used the term uncritical solidarity, which of course invites you to think about the notion of what critical solidarity would be about. And I thought that was just a wonderful phrase for, for really, I think, sort of encapsulating some of my own thoughts about, about, about the food bank issue. Because I think what we, where we've been with food banking is that the problem is that it prevents our understanding food charity as a barrier to food access because it's actually denying people the right to shop for themselves and choose their own food in normal and customary ways. It, uh, and, and in that sense, it, it, it transgresses, I think, some of our most fundable human rights principles because we're denying people choice, we're denying people human dignity, we're denying people uh, the opportunity to make their food selections, whether it's for good food or for bad food, that's not really not the point. Of course, those are issues, but it's really, about a, it's really a fundamental issue about choice. So, so that's one area I, I want to say a little bit more about, this, this question of um, uh, food banking being part of the problem and not the solution to domestic hunger. Secondly, I think it's very important um, that if we're going to confront widespread food poverty in first world societies, that we need to reframe the conversation from one of food charity to that of the right to food. And this means, I, in my, and I, I, I believe this sort of very strongly, that we have to reject the notion that it is both ethical and effective to give away wasted food, which is surplus to the requirements of the food production and food retailing system, to feed hungry people who are themselves viewed um, as either undervalued, underpaid, and disregarded units of labor power, or they're regarded as surplus to the requirements of, 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 of the labor market. I think there are some very deep ethical questions here, but it's also a very problematic discussion to engage because as a, as a, a, a colleague actually at the University of Victoria in, in, in BC has said, an anthropologist, she made this comment at a conference I was at uh, two or three years ago. She said, the ideology of philanthropy inhibits serious critique. And I think, in a sense to me, this actually gets to the heart of the matter. Once you start engaging with questions of charity, you have to, I think, really be clear about what your arguments are in terms of a critique of it, precisely because there is a moral imperative to feed hungry people. And so if you go down that route, beware because there will be, I, 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 I think, uh, 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 um, sort of issues raised that, that somehow are, sometimes are difficult to, to address. And the third question that I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is this question of governance. And governance, I think, invites the question, who's in charge in terms of addressing food poverty, say, in the UK? Is it the state? Is it the food corporations? Is it charitable organizations? And Going on from that, then, what are the possibilities for the right to food embedded in the International Covenant on Social Rights, which has been ratified by the majority of UN member organizations, including the UK in, in, in 1976? 
What is the possibilities there for attracting government attention? I mean, does the right to food actually have legs? Is it, does it provide us with a framework for, for moving forward? Or is it just largely a piece of rhetoric that some of us can refer to from time to time in terms of trying to engage a, a, a new debate about this issue? But I do think there are possibilities there, even though, as Tina and I know in the book, we weren't very hopeful, actually, when this came out. But we weren't very hopeful, I, I remember, when the 1997 book came out either. So, you know, where are we at? But I, I, I think it's still a more pertinent question. And actually, it's a more pertinent question today because I think that right to food discourse has been gauging some form of international uh, 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 attention. So, okay, well, what then about this, this, this question of food charity being part of the problem and not the solution? Actually, when I, when I wrote my first book about this issue, it was in 1986. I mean, it is nearly 30 years ago, and it was called Food Banks and the Welfare Crisis. And that was about the situation in, in, in Canada. Um, and I think at that time I explained this phenomenon, or I talked about this phenomenon as, that, as food banks as being symptoms and symbols of a welfare state in crisis. And I have to reflect, you know, we're still talking about a welfare state in crisis. Um, how much longer can we go on talking perhaps about the welfare state? Maybe we have to find some new ways of talking about what's happened. I remember Richard Titmus, my old prof at the London School of Economics, he would always say, well, if you want to talk about the welfare state, maybe think about the converse, you know, what about the ill-fare state? Is that where we've arrived today? And I think uh, maybe it is. So certainly then... Um, the book, I think, speaks very much to the growth and strength of food charity. I think, you know, we, uh, Tina and I, I think, in terms of our, our, our writing about this and, and seeing what the other authors have been saying, recognize that there is this moral imperative uh, to feed hungry people. It, it, it's been expressed in many countries around the world. It is, it is an absolute, absolutely acceptable sort of approach. It's very deeply embedded in, 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 in the world's sort of major religions and in cultures. And I think our, the, the book, in terms of the, the countries we, we covered, not just Christian Catholic countries, but also, um, uh, also Islam in terms of, of Turkey and Taoism, Buddhism in terms of Hong Kong and China, uh, Ubuntu, which is actually a, a, a notion uh, among uh, uh, Aboriginal peoples in, in, in South Africa. All these commitments to actually address the hungry needs of people are expressed there, and it's a, it's a legitimate, highly legitimate community response. It's a form of what I, I think we've called sort of practical compassion. It's about so, it is about solidarity, you know, with the hungry. Uh, but I think the question is, Uncritical solidarity, where does that lead us if we're not actually then beginning to address the systemic causes of food poverty and the structural causes? Because if we don't go there, then what really is the function of, of, the, of the charity that we're providing? And I think in that context, it's important to think back to Janet Poppendick's comment in the US chapter um, and her book, Sweet Charity, published in 1998, where she talked about charitable food giving and food banking in the United States as serving the function of a moral safety valve. So we have moral commitments on the one hand, moral imperatives on the other hand, but, on the, but, but yet you know, we, th there is this, moral, there's, there's this element of the moral safety valve that we do our bit, but it kind of lets us off the hook. We can carry on, but we don't really have to give attention to, to the underlying issues. So that's sort of one theme, I think, in, in, in terms of why this form of food charity is part of the problem, not the solution. Another, and I think this, this comes out very clearly in the book as well, is that domestic hunger or food poverty is not an, it's not an issue of food supply. It's not, it's not that we don't have enough food. Whether, you know, whatever the quality of the food, it's not that we don't have enough, either by import or, or internal production, but it is actually a question of food access. And this question of food access is very much, uh, uh, the, the barriers to it are, are caused by income poverty. These are, you know, low wages, I mean, the working poor. Um, for example, it might interest you to know that in Canada, uh, where we have very good uh, food insecurity data, 60% of people who are food insecure are working poor. They're not people who are dependent on welfare or social assistance uh, 
uh, or, or benefits, in, in, you know, as, a, as, in, as you describe it in the UK. These are people who are actually working. I mean, they're, they're fulfilling this work ethic, and yet they still can't afford to put food on the table. So, you know, there, there are some s serious issues here, and of course, there are problems of, 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 of uh, inadequate benefits of, of the, in terms of the welfare poor. And I, and I think what we, we wrote in the sort of final concluding chapter was this notion very much that uh, this is really the failure of uh, 30 years of, of, neo, of the neoliberal mantra that the best and only social policy is work. That actually is what's been driving this. And, you know, which is now being forwarded by uh, um, welfare reform and workfare policies. And one sees this increasingly in the UK, and it's sort of part of the crisis. So 30 years of neoliberalism. And I can remember, and some of you may know this politician's name. He's a very high-ranking conservative politician in the government today, Oliver Letwin. I can remember Oliver Letwin coming to Saskatchewan when I was working there in the 1980s. He was an acolyte of, of Margaret Thatcher. And he was, and we had, we just elected a right-wing conservative government, and he was there advising the government on the kind of neoliberal policies that we've actually seen today. And I can remember debating actually on television with the Minister of Social Services of the province of Saskatchewan, who was declaring repeatedly, there's no poverty in our province. So this isn't all happenstance, this is sort of part of a long, deliberate uh, 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 assault, if you like, I would call it an assault, you know, by the people on the right to work towards minimal government, deregulation, privatization, localization, subsidiarity, that principle is very important. Push it all back to the local roots. Actually, of course, for women, it basically is, 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 a, is, 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 a, is an anti-feminist organization as well, because who are the people who are meant to be doing the caring? It's women. So I think these are this, this is not something that's just sort of occurred. It's actually, it, 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 it's deliberate. So, and I think this is actually, if you like, sort of borne out as well, because we, we see, I mean, the book, I think, tells the story, the latest book tells the story of how food banking has, has become more entrenched. Now, it is correct that when periods of economic growth occur, food bank usage might go down, but actually they never really go down below the point at which they last began to rise. And so you have this, institutionalized system of care, of, 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 of charitable food uh, delivery uh, becoming sort of further ensconced. Um, so I think my sort of shortened form of that is really to say that uh, food banks are really a neoliberal dream come true, a nightmare for people on the other side, but this is actually really what they've been arguing for. Now it may be providing them with all kinds of political problems, but it won't really provide them with political problems unless parties on the left and parties that you would expect to actually understand what's going on agree to engage the debate. Because if they don't, I can, would say with a fair degree of assurity that these, these, this, this issue that you've got in Britain today is going to become further and further entrenched. So another aspect then of this being sort of part of the problem and not the solution is really to think about the hidden functions of increasingly corporatized, I underline that word corporatized, charitable food banking. Because I think what's happened is that we've, it's, it's been successfully managed that we've created the public perception that food, bank, that food poverty is being addressed. You know, if we feel we've done our bit, we've engaged with the community, we, we've done what's expected of us, we see increasing, I'll say a little bit more about this, the corporations, the, you know, the transnational food corporations becoming involved in sort of managing and developing food banks, that in fact uh, government can afford to look the other way. It doesn't actually have to address this. It might be worried about it, but let it continue because we're not going to be asking taxpayers to up their taxes to increase their contributions so that we can afford somehow to develop a, a, a meaningful and... and, and, and and caring uh, uh, public policy. Uh, and, I and, and what I do want to say is that this has, been a this has been brought about over the years by this neoliberal social construction of hunger, of domestic hunger, as a matter for charity. It's, it's, it's part of the downloading, the downsizing, the outsourcing. Uh, these are the different terms that are used in different chapters to sort of push this back onto the community 
uh, as if this is actually the responsibility of the community and that they actually have the resources to be able to address the, the problems. So I think that's something that I'd, I'd like to sort of leave with you in, in, in a way. It, it's this deliberate social construction of domestic hunger as being a matter for charity and not an issue of human rights and not an issue of public policy. It's not something that we really have to be concerned about because if you remember, their particular policy is that the best and only social policy is work. And if you do not have an attachment to the labor market, then in fact you're going to be on the outside looking in. Uh, and I think this is, this, is, this is sometimes when I think when we sort of write about this academically, we might talk about the commodification of welfare uh, in, 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 in that sense. So what's the evidence for this? Well, I think there, there are certain points which certainly, again, I think are reflected in the book. We've seen in certainly in North America, we've seen in, I think, beginning to see this now in, in Canada and other countries, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, we've begun to see the national institutionalization and global corporatization of charitable food banking. Uh, if you go back to the first food bank in the United States in 1967 in Phoenix, Arizona, it was just established as a, as a small community uh, a, 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 um, organization to actually recycle wasted food, interestingly, but also to use that in terms of you know, supporting uh, sort of local, local food programs. This was in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, in 1978, that became Second Harvest, and Second Harvest today has become Feeding America. Um, we've, we've seen that, we saw that in Canada as well. In Canada, where the first food bank was established in 1981, a few years later, it had become a national organization called the Canadian Association of Food Banks. And then in 2006, it became Food Banks Canada. Now, if you hear the word Food Banks Canada, we've now got Food Banks Hong Kong. We've now got Food Banks Australia. We've now got... You can begin to see the, the corporatization. You've be, you can begin to see that spread. It's, it's, been, it's, been, it, 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 it's been taken over. And what's their moniker? Well, their moniker is that food banking... You can go online. Food banking is the link between food waste and hunger. In other words, the corporations are there in terms of addressing this issue of our domestic poverty and domestic hunger through, the, through simply supplying food that's surplus to their requirements to feed hungry people. Of course, there is a whole other section as well of, of charitable food giving that has no connections at, 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 at the corporate level. But this is, the, but, but, but what I'm talking about here is where, is where the food corporations are becoming involved. Cargill, Kellogg, uh, in different countries, Kraft, uh, PepsiCo, Walmart. Walmart, here's a country, that, here's, here, here's a corporation. Uh, and again, in, in the book, uh, Andy Fisher talks about Walmart, which of course is non-unionized, pays its workers sort of, you know, sub-poverty wages. Uh, gives food for food banks, and then the workers actually have to go to the food bank to actually get their food. So you've got to, I think, think sort of start thinking about what is actually occurring here in terms of this form of, of, of food relief. And the social construction of um, hunger as a matter for charity in Canada, and I'm not so sure how this is occurring now in the UK, but is also fed by professional sports. I mean, Canadian football, the American kind of football, I mean, has a program called Tackle Hunger. Well, you know, football, rugby, tackling, tackle hunger. Uh, it's on television. I mean, it, it, it's sort of part of every game that you would go to. Uh, you know, you're invited to, to bring your food, and they are seen to be uh, uh, contributing to, to this problem. Rock stars, you know, rock concerts, I mean, musicians, I mean, because it, it you know, it, it, there's a sort of direct, this moral imperative is being expressed here. We even have poverty tourism. Now, I was actually shocked. I mean, it's sometimes it now actually, having looked at this for a long time, it takes me, it, it, it takes something to shock me now. But in Victoria, you know, the, the, which is the provincial capital of British Columbia, uh, we have cruise ships coming in, you know, in, in, in the summer months. They now have an occasion, uh, a, a pos uh, an opportunity for people who are tourists on the cruise ships to leave the cruise ships and go down and help out at the local food bank. So this, I mean, uh, uh, I find this uh, 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 sort of very problematic, but 
it, 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 it's a matter that you can't really get sort of much attention to in, 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 in terms of uh, uh, developing a critique. And perhaps one of the reasons is, is that the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is the public broadcaster in Canada, you know, equivalent to the BBC, although I have to say the CBC has been slowly having its funding reduced and is becoming more privatized. Every year for the past 25 years, they have annual food bank drives, right? At Christmas, like last year in Vancouver, uh, you know, if you, in, in, at the CBC studios, if you, um, uh, you're invited to go and make your contribution to the food bank, I mean, that's in terms of a monetary donation. And if you do that, then you get permitted to go into the CBC studios and meet the so-called you know, uh, 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 CBC celebrities who actually come across the country. It's not simply, it's not simply a provincial, you know, BC operation. It's actually a Canadian operation. And um, they raised last year six hundred thousand dollars. Well, that it sounds like a, a, a you know a large chunk of change, but in fact there are ninety thousand people a month in, in in BC. It's sort of dependent upon food banks. So if you divide one by the other you'll see that, I mean, that the contributions people are making are very small. But of course, what is happening when you have your, your, your national broadcaster facilitating this kind of debate about why we should be supporting food banks, and when, of course, we have been trying to engage with them about why don't you have a national right to food day? Yeah? Well, no, you know, we, uh, we give you some time, you know, every now and again to sort of talk about this, but this is not where we're at. Um, and, of course, it, it, because it we're regarded as actually being, making sort of political comments, whereas providing charitable food banking is not a political question at all. So I think, the, so I think we can safely say that in North America and in many other countries as well, charitable corporatized food banking, this practice of uncritical solidarity, is publicly perceived and accepted as the thing to do. And I think there's a lot that hangs on the word publicly perceived. There's a perception that this is actually what's occurring. And I think the problem is, how do we get the facts out to people that, in fact, the problem isn't being addressed? And, 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 I, and I think that's sort of really a, a, a key question. So what then to make of corporate food banking's claim that food waste is the answer to food poverty? I think from an ethical standpoint, and in light of its demonstrated, the demonstrated ineffectiveness of the food bank model, with perhaps the possible exception of Brazil, I think it's highly questionable. And the reason why, and I think for that reason why it is essential to change the food poverty conversation from one of, of food banks and charity to food justice, the right to food, and public policy. What then about this sort of ethical questions? Well, I think uh, food waste, of course, is certainly an ethical, environmental, and economic it, uh, issue of, of immense importance. Um, and for the food system and food retailing industry, it certainly demands attention and, re and requires solutions. But I think we have to ask, or we have to declare, that this issue cannot and should not be solved at the expense of hungry people. I think, I think this, it certainly... There are major questions there, but are we using one set of problems to try and solve another set of problems? And particularly when we talk about this sort of ineffectiveness question. So we might then say, well, what motivates this channel, channeling of wasted food to feed hungry people and, sur and, and, and to feed hungry and surplus people? Perhaps there is a genuine concern for the environment, but of course, community, but, but um, Corporate social responsibility is clearly a strong calling card to food banks who are always running out of food. They need sourcing. There isn't enough food that people in the community can actually purchase in terms of that, that, uh, as additions to their food budget, and nor is there uh, a, a probably enough you know, wasted food to go around. So this is, this is a very strong calling card. As the South African uh, uh, author says in the book, but is this really a case of corporate social responsibility or is it really a case of corporate social investment? And I think that there's probably a lot hangs on that. Certainly, there's a presumption an image of corporate management efficiency, effectiveness and goodwill goes a long way. But who really is benefiting and why from, the dispos from this disposal of surplus food? Is it a win-win for both? Is it a win-win for both sides, or is it more about corporate branding, t 
tax exemptions, price structures and profit making, lack of regard for low wages in, in, in the food retail sector, and the creation, as Tina has written about in Finland, of a, of a secondary food market where food bank users, uh, unable to purchase the food of their choice, are denied autonomy and human dignity by having to accept the donated surplus foods on offer that day. And I think these are kind of questions that should be posed you know, to those who are running these multinational corporations, national food companies, in terms of, uh, 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 of, uh, of, of, of the ethics of, 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 of this situation. What exactly are they doing? Do we hear them actually talking about you know, the needs for a living wage? Do we hear them talking about the needs for an adequate social wage? Do we, need, do we hear them talking about um, the difficulties of, of, uh, of, of, of addressing these issues if, if the continual call is, is for lower taxes? And I think the, these, to me, sort of get to the heart of this matter. Um, I mean, I might also add it the, uh, 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 as well that uh, it isn't simply the corporations. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest perhaps that governments have lost their moral compass. And we don't, and maybe governments have lost their moral compass, but opposition parties seem to have lost it as well because we don't hear from them about the, 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 the critical issues and dilemmas that are involved in this kind of model of, 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 of trying to address food poverty. So there are, I think there are ethical questions here, but there are also, there are also questions about food bank e effectiveness or ineffectiveness. And maybe these are the kinds of arguments that over time, if we're talking about what more research needs to be done and what civil society should be doing and where, uh, where academics you know, should be, is actually looking at the effectiveness of, of food banks. Um, I think this is a critical issue because on the one hand we've got this image of managerial efficiency uh, and, and, and effectiveness, ensuring a steady supply of quality food. I think all that needs to be examined. And we also have, we have food bank data on the volumes of food provided, uh, uh, on the numbers of recipients and meals served. If you go to any food bank sort of website, Trussell Trust or uh, Fair Share or Food Banks Canada, you will see this data. Um, but the problem is that the UK, and I th maybe this is the most, most important point I'll make, and if, any, if you want to remember anything that I said, the UK does not actually have national data on food insecurity. It doesn't collect this data. Canada does, the US does. It's not necessarily to say that simply because they do, they have a better record but you can't actually begin to talk about national policy if you don't have this data. Uh, and I think it, 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 it's, um, I mean, you can, you can infer it from the food poverty statistics, you can infer it from food expenditure data, but you really need to collect that data. And if you collect that data as we do in, the, in, in, in Canada, you know from Valerie Tarasak's work at the University of Toronto, you know she's a professor of nutrition, does this excellent quantitative analysis and and is a part of the, you know, the survey team in the US and, and in Canada, only 20 to 30 percent of people who are food insecure actually go to food banks. So you've got a critical question here that if you start constructing your public policy on the basis of food bank data, in terms of the causes, in terms of what to do about it, you're going to be seriously awry. And I think this is probably a fundamental point that actually needs to be underwritten. And we need our allies in different disciplines, different academic disciplines, to actually come to the party on this, to, 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 to look at this data. So I think that that's, a, that's an important point. The, the other obvious point, and I think maybe I'm sure you all know, food banks constantly, always I would say, probably always, run out of food. They never have enough food. I mean, because they never have enough food, they have to ration it more tightly. You know, they're not open sort of every day of the week. I mean, the amount of food that they give out, you know, I think, well, trust the trust, I think, it gives the three vouchers, right? Which gives you, what, three amount for three meals, something like that. And then you can go back and maybe you'll get a fourth voucher. But then this depends probably on the vague eligibility criteria and whoever happens to be dispersing the food on, on that day. So it's all hit and miss. There, there are no guarantees. As we say again in the book, all this, all this food that is actually provided whether it's rescued, surplus, wasted, donated, however you want to define it, is essentially a gift. It's not a right. It's not an entitlement. It's not something that you can claim. 
It's not in terms of the old sort of, in, 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 well, in, in, terms of the old, in terms of systems of insecurity, where at least there are, I hope there still are, I mean, they're gradually being diminished in Canada, benefit tribunals where you can actually go and make a claim, you can actually appeal a decision. There's, there is no appeal in this system other than the kindness, perhaps, of and generosity of the food bank volunteer. So this is a volunteer-run industry with, with all the issues as, uh, associated with that. So you've got, and there's no guarantee that special dietary needs can be accommodated. The vague eligibility criteria is largely dependent on volunteer goodwill. It's stigmatizing, of course, for many, which I think explains why in Canada so few people actually go to the food banks, even though they're feeding 900,000 people a month. This is a gross underestimate of the numbers of people who are food insecure. Actually, the, the data in Canada shows that 3.9 million Canadians, that's a little over 10% of the population, are food insecure. Food bank data would lead you to believe it's you know, 900,000 a month. So w I think that this question of underestimating is, is, is important. So I, I, I think there's little evidence that food banks, this is borne out in the book as well, offer an effective response. They are, as we report in First World Hunger uh, uh, Revisited, constrained by the limited resources, which I think was a phrase that Tito wrote, you know, that restrained by the limited resources. Could we expect anything else? A gesture of goodwill, but unable to, to deal with the problem. Um, okay, I'm just sort of moving ahead here. What then are, okay, so what then are the possibilities for the right to food? Does it have legs? What influence, if, if any, might the right to food have in attacking, in attracting the attention of government in terms of addressing the food poverty crisis and the making of joined up public policy? I think the question's here, who's in charge? Where is the political will? We say in the book that there's little hope for the right to food in the continuing context of neoliberalism. If this economic regime that we've been experiencing for the last 30 years continues for another 30 years, I don't think the right to food is going to be able to uh, begin to uh, uh, address the questions. Um, now, we know that state, I mean, the point really about the right to food is that states' parties, you know, including the UK, they've ratified the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, where the right to food is embedded in the, in the commitment and the obligation to ensure an adequate standard of living for people. But many countries sort of walk away or, or neglect their ongoing obligations. I do have to say two or three things, though, about the right to food. The right to food is not about giving away free food to hungry people, nor is it about the government doing everything for people. Now, I suppose I would regard myself, or have come to regard myself as a kind of, a, if you like, a kind of right to food fundamentalist uh, or essentialist, that I don't think charity is a part of the right to food. I think this is problematic, actually, in the food policy area, because I think people will make that argument. And, but I think if you make that argument, then you're, you're in difficult grounds, because um, uh, in terms of this, the ineffectiveness of that model, it's not to say that people shouldn't give, be charitable. It's not that people should not uh, act upon their moral imperatives but this is not what the right to food is about. Of course, the right to food is, in, is informed by moral imperatives, but it's also informed by legal imperatives, and it's informed by political imperatives in terms of collective responsibility. And I think this is a, you may say this is a moot point, but I think it's an, it's an important one uh, to make. Because the right to food is realized, and I'm sort of using general comment 12 language here, 1999, is realized when every man, woman, and child alone or in community with others have physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or the means for its procurement. Because if you push this along the line of, 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 uh, of human rights principles about sort of universality and human dignity and autonomy and participation, in our kind of society, we all need money in our pockets to be able to go into a food store, and as Liz Dowler has said this, you know, like anybody else, and purchase the food of your choice. That is normal, that is customary. I mean, I can think of this going back to Peter Townsend's definitions of poverty and, 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 and the book he wrote in 1979 on poverty in Britain, in which he has a clear definition of poverty in sort of relative terms, but it's about people being able to do the things that are normal and customary. 
being able to invite your neighbor over for a cup of tea, for a, uh, you know, a, a sandwich, just to do the normal things. We're not talking about sort of going on European holidays or whatever, but just to be... So when you can't do that, I think um, your, your rights are actually being infringed upon. Maybe people can provide assistance in terms of charitable relief, but that's actually not what fundamentally is, is meant by, 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 a, by a human rights or right to food approach. Um, so, it, so I think you know, the right to food is about enabling all to produce and acquire food through normal and customary ways, the right to feed oneself and one's family with dignity and choice. Importantly, the right to food is what we say justiciable. I mean, it is a legal concept, but we have to remember that a right is only a right if it can be claimed. Otherwise, it kind of begins to lose it, it, its sense of, of the meanings of the term. Um, but it's not only, and we were talking about this at, at lunch, it's not only a narrow legalistic concept. The, the idea of social rights sets out a framework, I think, for collective action. I mean, it's, and it's not sort of written in stone, but, it, but it's really where uh, the state, I think, is assuming its obligations under international law. Governments are the primary duty bearers, that's the language used in international law, to, realize, to fully realize the right to food in the society as part of an adequate standard of living. And, you know, built upon these principles of uh, universality, human dignity, autonomy, participation, accountability, non-discrimination, and the rule of law. You may say that's a long listing of, of terms, but I think they all have very specific meanings, and I think they have to be taken together. There is an indivisibility of the notion of human rights. I would have really liked to hear our politicians on the left actually talking about these issues, talking about human rights and actually what it means and how that's translated into policy, but they've become very quiet and I think it's a problem. So I think, of course, what the critics would say about this, well, you're never going to get their riches, you know, it's not going to happen because the UK government, the Canadian government isn't, and certainly not the United States government, which has never ratified any of these conventions, I mean, because they always claim sovereignty and they always claim we'd never get all the states on board. Actually, Canada did get all the states on board in 1976 when it, when it ratified them, so I think you know, they need to do a little bit of rethinking about that. But I think what, what the critics would say was, um, you know, really to give this the force of law, you've got to embed it in the Constitution, or you've got to embed it in, in, in you know, the language of the right to food um, in, 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 in domestic legislation. But I think... Regardless of that, the right to food and the work of the right to food unit of the UN uh, Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, have set out, I think, excellent sort of guidelines, particularly focused on countries of the South, in terms of frameworks for including the right to food, including the notion of uh, Amatia Sen's uh, ideas of entitlement, you know, in terms of addressing the U U Indian famine and in, 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 in the in, in the post-World War II era in India, this notion of entitlement, you know, because in what, they, what he discovered and what he learned was that uh, there was enough food in India actually to feed, to feed people, but it was all being hoarded. It was all being... Uh, uh, and so I think this sort of brings you to the question of entitlement and, 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 and of rights. And it, it, it does provide a framework for development and the implementation of what Olivia de Scuta, who is the just the very recent UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food would say is, is, is the importance of having national framework law, of having a national joined up uh, food policy, not just to address the questions of the supply side of, the, of, the, of, 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 um, of food policy, which I think I would say in my little sort of critical voice is basically where a lot of food policy is, 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 is concerned with, but also on the food distribution side, on the demand side, and actually engaging questions of access. You could have the most perfect food system in the world, but if people can't access it, you have to start saying, well, what, what is the point of, 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 of what we're trying to do? So, and, and also, I think what's embedded in, the, in this right to food notion, well, this parallel joined up measures and in income distribution, public health, social policy, education and employment policy, uh, policies, specifically looking at the living wage, adequate welfare benefits, affordable housing. You can see as I talk that 
well, how do we get our heads around to this? How do we begin to shape these policies? Well, I do have an idea about that, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a minute. But embedded also here is this notion of planning and accountability. We need, and I've said this already, we need national food insecurity or food poverty indicators. We need plans with targets. We need plans with timelines and benchmarks. We need independent monitoring me mechanisms. We need to be aware that every five years, all countries, all states which have actually ratified this international convention make reports to the UN you know, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights about, how, about the progress that they're making in relation to this. I think w when I s discovered this myself in terms of my first book about uh, you know, all those years ago, and actually later in terms of the second book in 1997, I began to, of course, I began to learn that actually many civil servants are, no, are simply not aware of it. People, people do not know. Politicians certainly don't know about it. But many of civil servants who should know are, are unaware of actually the requirements and the obligations. So no wonder there's very little sort of public debate about it or we feel that there's nothing that we can really do. But these, these are times when the UK is sort of held up to account on the, on the European state. I mean, I know they don't like that very much. But uh, 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 on the international stage, in terms of, 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 of addressing the, the, these issues, there are justiciable remedies as well through the courts. I mean, they, that certainly I think has possibilities, although it's limited. And there's a multi-stakeholder approach. So I'm just going to finish by saying, well, you know, I've, I've been looking at this a long time. What are what are, what are the kinds of things that really um, uh, come through to you? this point. Because I think that in, the, in one sense, if we say that, you know, the right to food has sort of limited sort of possibilities at the moment, one could say, well, this is perhaps sort of somewhat discouraging. But I still nevertheless think that it's important to ask, you know, and I th as, as what, uh, you know, Tim has done in terms of this food thing, this talk, what then are the challenges for, you know, for academics and civil society in terms of what I would argue is the need to shift this national discussion about what to do about food poverty and from one of an endless discussion about food charity um, to that of food justice and the right to food and, and the advancing public policy. I, I often get sort of emails from students who are uh, you know, doing master's thesis and wanting to know how they can improve you know, the food charity system. And I have to be very polite and write back and say, I'm sorry, this is really not what I... Th this is not what the issue is for me. I don't think that's going to get us to where I hope you want to go, you know. Um, so I think that um, maybe the first point I would make is that food charity is not part of the right to food. In responding to food poverty, I think we've got to think outside the charitable food aid box. We've got to stand back, look at the system as a whole and what's occurring, and begin to think some different thoughts. Um, I think we need to recognize uh, that this increasingly sort of corporatizing charitable food bank model, uh, with its message of food waste as the answer to domestic hunger, though it, 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 it's, it, the system, as we know, is constrained by limited resources, is here for the long haul. Uh, given the continuation of global of, the, of this of, of our global neoliberal project, um, and I think that uh, this 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 really uh, uh, is a challenge to us, and I think you know we need to be sort of thinking very carefully about that, um, uh, because I do think that dis despite you know charitable food banks sort of being part of the neoliberal dream, come true, nevertheless. They are a useful lens. They are a useful metaphor as a way, I think, for sort of talking about issues, critical questions of, of, of food inequalities and the lack of public policy. And I think one of the reasons one can say that is I know that, you know, we're all interested in food in different ways because food connects us all. I mean, we all have this intimate relationship with us. But maybe in a similar way food banks do as well because I think many people in the community have a relationship with food bank. Banks. And I'd noticed when I've sort of been traveling around the country, um, talking to academics, but talk, also talking to, to, to people uh, on the street. And actually, I was at a demonstration in George Square in, in Glasgow in sort of anti-poverty groups. I mean, people have very, uh, I think, strong feelings about what is occurring. And I think the, 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 the food bank metaphor, if you like, the food bank lens, 
does actually have traction. I think you can actually construct a debate about the wider, broader issues building on this. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's, it's important that we recognize that food poverty is primarily a function of, of, of inadequate income and benefits and a broken social safety net. I think this is, this is clearly. But, but maybe, you know, there is a malfunctioning, you know, food retailing, food production system, but those are questions that, I, and again, I think in the book we say that, that that system, the corporate system, really needs to be looking at itself. It's not really a... a, 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 a it's not really a question that, that, that relates, in my view anyway, to the, to, to the question of food poverty. So income, uh, I, I think, is important. I'll reiterate again, I think the lack of national food insecurity data and indicators in the UK is a key impediment, um, without which I think there's probably little hope for, joining, for, for developing joined up public policy, because you need that essential data, I think, to begin sort of making the arguments. So I would say sort of bring on the quantitative analysis here uh, uh, to do that. The other, one or two other points, and, I, and then I will finish. Um, are we witnessing a long-term shift from income security and social security and cash transfers as a way of ensuring uh, people's opportunity and capacity to participate in society are we witnessing a long-term shift away from that model to one of direct food relief? It's because this actually is the system, by and large, in the United States. And there, I think we need to really bear in mind that one in six, one in seven of the population are actually food insecure. And if you go back to the 1960s, and I had a long discussion with Janet Poppendick about this about a month ago, is that in the 1960s, there was a, you know, the rediscovery of poverty, the rediscovery of hunger, and there was a debate among the activists. And the activists, the debate was about, are we going to go the food relief way or are we going to go the income security way? And they went the food relief way. And I think that's um, tied into you know, long-term industrial agriculture, overproduction of food, etc. And where that has, has left us well, in, in, in the States is really the agricultural uh, sector and, and the lobbies in Congress are really determining um, assistance and, uh, 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 and, and are critical uh, agents here in, 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 in how relief is, is, is provided and how assistance is providing. So I think this shift is, it, so one of my questions might be is, are we witnessing, these are I think are sort of researchable questions, you know? Are we, uh, is this the Americanization of, the UK's you know, Canadian so social welfare system, European systems, is this what's occurring? Neoliberalism, Americanization, is that really where we want to go? I think these are, these are the kinds of uh, policy choices that, 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 that are suggested there. Is this offloading, outsourcing, downstreaming, downsizing, a retreat to localism? Um, are food banks the unwitting vanguard of a return to 19th century poor law relief? Maybe that sounds a bit apocalyptic, but on the other hand, it's difficult to are they the new workhouses in a way? I mean, it may seem a sort of rather strange way of sort of expressing it, but uh, uh, is this really how we want to address, you know, the needs of, of, of people, of vulnerable populations? Which leads me then to this point about, do we need a new beverage plan, right? Do we need, I mean, because I, I think, you know, we've got food poverty, we've got fuel poverty, we've got, you know, housing issues, we've got issues in education. Is it time actually to be standing back and saying, We've got to rethink where we're going. We can't actually take it sort of bit by bit, piecemeal by piecemeal. There actually there's time, not just for a, a new Fabian Commission on food poverty, which is actually, I know, being undertaken now, uh, but, a, but, but, but a commission that actually is, 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 is dealing with the, with the large issues. Because I think this, this experiment we've had over the past 30 or year, more years, you know, since since Thatcher came to power, I think has, has, has undone a lot of, of, of what we thought was important. And finally, I will just say that this question is, is you know, is, is what do we mean by critical solidarity? And here, I, I would actually just like to make the point, perhaps we should be looking to Scotland, okay? So I just, I, okay, so I just spent a couple of days in Scotland, you know, talking in Glasgow and going to Narrow Scotland and 
of course, hearing a lot about the referendum. But what I also heard was um, more devolution, more taxation powers, welfare being devolved. And I began to think that maybe here then there is a possibility for the Scottish Parliament to begin talking about taking some of this language and some of the concepts and precepts of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and beginning to write that into their legislation. Now, I don't know, probably Westminster would be appalled at that or would say that you can't go there, but power is something I think you take. You know, you, you can't sort of wait for it to be given to you. And I could give you examples actually in Canada where at the provincial level in Saskatchewan, which actually introduced Medicare into Canada, it wasn't a top-down event sort of in the 1960s. It was done, actually, I said this in Scotland, by a Scotsman who'd emigrated, Tommy Douglas, who became the premier of, of the province. And he introduced Medicare. There was a strike. The doctors went on strike. So what did he do? He just recruited more from Scotland and more from England. They came and worked in community clinics. And actually, that's how, that's how um, universal health care came to Canada. And it didn't, happen, it didn't happen at the national level. It happened at the provincial, local level. So it, when I was in Scotland, it, I, b I began to think, well, maybe there's some opportunities here. Perhaps I'm being very fanciful and sort of out to lunch on that. But uh, I think it's, I think it's, it, 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 it's something that we, we, we need to be thinking about. So I suppose finally I'd say, you know, food banks are a form of, uh, of, of, of critical... Uh, 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 if, if we look at food banks from the perspective of critical solidarity, then what would the research and policy questions be? So I'm sorry for going on for so long. Okay. Yeah. Anne Murcott, SOAS. Is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, no, it's only being recorded by that. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, thank you, Graham. That was very, very um, compelling. Um, I, I've got a, a question for you because you were very clear in your first two themes mm -hmm. uh, that uh, anyway, not only were food banks the, the problem, not the solution, but they were part of the, the whole neoliberal complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you might have added industrial into that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then I was really intrigued because you then went in your third section for policy solutions. Uh, particularly appealing to uh, Peter Townsend's definition of po poverty, relative poverty. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was expecting you to go straight for Coates and Silburn, mm -hmm. where they, of course, talk about poverty as powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I wondered whether you could comment on why you went for Townsend rather in, and, and uh, um, relative poverty plus a, a policy solution rather than hitting rather harder with a sort of polit political economy hat on, mm -hmm. uh, to go for Coates and Silburn's definition of poverty as powerlessness and then talk straight about inequality on all kinds of dimensions. Mm -hmm. Well, I b maybe that's a question about Just sort of absolute poverty issues on the one hand and <coughs> food inequalities on the other. Um, no, not no. Like Mm -hmm. oh, Am I allowed to? Yes, yes yeah, yeah. It wasn't so much a question of, of asking you to replace Townsend's relative poverty mm -hmm. with the notion of absolute poverty, mm -hmm. so much as, as talking about, because what Coates and Silburn did, of course, was mm -hmm. say, look, we, we don't just want to talk about poverty, we also want to talk about the wealthy, and mm -hmm. we want to talk about the way it's distributed. And what we want to talk about is poverty as lack of power. Mm -hmm. rather than poverty as mm -hmm. not being able to do what everybody else does on a Sunday mm -hmm. and have a yeah. Sunday joint, mm -hmm. which is, of course, what Townsend did. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered why you, having, you know, you didn't hammer it hard, but it was running there through all the way mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. was the sort of neoliberal <coughs> l reducing okay. regulation okay. and, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. you've got mm -hmm. uh, a food system mm -hmm. where you refer to it because, of course, the waste that comes out then, that's, yeah, that's yeah, very helpful yeah, for yeah, the food banks, yeah. except that you don't get quite yeah, enough, yeah, yeah. Um, without actually saying, but what is the relationship between governments, uh, particularly those uh, neoliberal uh, governments mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. want to reduce regulation, mm -hmm and the nature of the industrial food supply, the industrial mm -hmm. food mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. and the power that that has. Right, right. Well, I suppose 
I mean, I think an alternative way for me to think about that is, 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 a, is a critique you know, of wealth. And, and I think if one, turns, if one turns it into sort of policy questions, I think for me a lot of it has to do with you know, the maldistribution of wealth, the inequitable you know, regressive forms of taxation, the fact that you know, powerful elites can uh, bleed the country of the kind of revenues that we need. I mean, I think that is, that is you know, that, I don't know if this is sort of <coughs> beginning to sort of address your question, but in terms of inequalities, I mean, why, why are we in this mess? Because we're always being told that we, we don't actually have to actually address these issues, when in fact, you know, I suppose the other bankers, if you like, not the food bankers, but the merchant bankers and the people, you know, in the city are, are um, uh, uh, sending their money offshore. I don't think it's a necessarily a very satisfactory response to your question, but I think that's, that's, that's a question a, about inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Jane Dixon from the Australian National University. And I'd like to build on, uh, I think, Anne's question and the commentary. I was actually really heartened, Graham, by you referring to the fact that um, the right to food is but one right to social goods, mm -hmm. housing, jobs, um, the right to feel secure in your own home. Uh, and I do think you were raising that question about can we um, think of ways to reinvigorate, you wouldn't ever be able to call it the welfare state anymore, but a way in which government does relate to the people, Anne, and, and does actually protect their interests. Uh, tries to address those power differentials. What I was, the paper that I have loved that Olivia de Schutter wrote was the one he co-wrote with the special rapporteur on the right to social protection. Mm -hmm. And there they jointly argued that we should, um, the world's government should establish a social protection floor and mechanism mm -hmm. so that all governments would contribute to a central pool and low and middle income countries would receive monies so they, sh they could establish social security mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. for when their people were out of work to support universal health care and the right to education for children. Now, I think it was interesting they said low and middle income countries because I think the rich countries, as you've just so, this book so beautifully points out, uh, they're failing their uh, citizens in terms of social <coughs> protections. My final point is I do understand the South African constitution is one of the very few in the world that has enshrined economic and social rights mm -hmm. into it. So not just political rights, but economic. And I wonder, yeah. mm -hmm. my question to you is, could we advance the situation regarding food poverty and these other poverties if all governments did incorporate social, economic, and political rights into their constitutions? South yeah. African and Brazil mm -hmm. are the only two mm -hmm. constitutions mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. have yeah. uh, mm -hmm. as you know it's mm -hmm. a developed country. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for those who don't know Graham's work, it, it's this is about the focus that you brought to this topic mm -hmm. is the rich world. Yes, yeah. The rich yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well James question, yeah. do you think it would be helpful to have constitutional right to food? So well I suppose I do think that. I mean I think it's a sort of logic of my, my argument. I mean, whether if it, they were to be in, so entrenched, it would necessarily lead to the kinds of um, uh, you know, progressive sort of policies that we would like to see is perhaps another matter. I think South Africa actually is a particular case because it, it hasn't actually happened there. 
but I think it has happened in, in Brazil to a certain extent because of Lulu, because of zero hunger. And actually the chapter in the book sort of does talk about food banks really being sort of a part of the realization of the right to food in that country. Now I, I actually think that there is sort of an aspect of that that isn't necessarily, um, it isn't as necessarily as clear as that because they, because the author didn't really talk very much about Bolsa Familia, which is an income-based uh, program, you know, in terms of conditional uh, income-based program, in terms of your children going to school, there are sort of income benefits, which appears to have, seems to have had, you know, a, 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 a lowering effect on the incidence of, of, of food insecurity. But yes, I think I'd, I, I mean, I, I think that, Let's put it like this. I think if countries were to be so mobilized that they were in, in, in the process of actually embedding those rights, I think, I think a sea change in political <laughs> attitudes would have occurred. So it's I, a movement it's to a get It's a movement, that. yeah. It's a movement Rather to get that, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think the right to food is, you know, it's a part of, it, it is a legalistic sort of justitable concept, but it's also, it's also a set of political ideas that, that might help to bring together various parties, you know, you'd like to think sort of on the left, you know, the sort of green movement, et cetera, uh, who have another, v another view about sort of dealing with issues of, you know, social inequality and, and food inequality yeah. wow. and power. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Hi, Dan Crossley from Food Ethics Council. Um, and apologies, I'll keep this quite short because I'm afraid we have to duck out in a couple of minutes. So apologies for leaving early. Mm -hmm. But thank you, it's fascinating. Um, I've probably got about 15 questions, but I'll just stick to one. Um, More than run. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Um, so I guess, the, I guess I'll stick to one question, which is um, if you were, if you, know, you, Graham Richards, were running as Prime Minister in the UK in 2015 or or equivalent in, in Canada or, or wherever else in the global north, um, what would be this, you've listed, there's various things you've, you've mentioned throughout the sort of uh, policy measures and ways of framing the discourse that you think would help. What would be the first thing that you would do to try and stop this further sort of slide into the sort of the model that we've seen in Canada and, and the US? What would be the first big thing you would do? Well, I think I might have a couple of things in mind. I think the first question I would, you know, I, th I think in, in one sense I stated that when I was talking, I would actually want to get clear about what the nature of food insecurity is in the country. I mean, I think, because without that, I don't need to see how we ha have a discussion about it. I do think, though, you know, that the, the second point that I would be thinking about was, has the welfare state run its course, and do we need to start bringing together the best minds, I mean, the people, you know, at the grassroots level as well, in terms of thinking about where we want to go. I mean, there's the market, and then, you know, there's the public sector. And perhaps putting down this notion there, I mean, we understand food as, I think, as a market good, but if we think about food as a public good, where does that, where does that lead us in, in what we want to do in terms of the optimal nourishment of the population and the eradication of, of food poverty? And I would probably sort of look at one or two other countries, I think sort of Norway and to some extent Scandinavian countries to see where they've been. I mean, because I, I recall when I was at school, you know, as at LSE, uh, sort of looking back on that, I think it was probably a fairly sort of chauvinistic time. I mean, because we just talked about the British welfare state. We weren't really sort of learning about what was going on in other parts of the world. And I think we could have benefited from that, actually, <laughs> quite considerably. <laughs> so, just, so. Just just very, very thank you. Yeah. Um, I won't respond fully because it's of time, but thank you. Um, uh, just on the first point about data, um, we we worked with Liz at the University of Warwick, yeah, yeah. commissioned by DEFRA last year, to, yeah. um, to do sort of try and map the extent and effectiveness. Yeah. So yeah, the DEFRA okay. report, which yeah, came out yeah. earlier this year, uh, which had yeah. one or two bumps along the way. I'll just yeah. leave it at that. But um, I guess well <laughs> part of the um, challenge, you know, the original sort of. Uh, uh, brief, if you like, was to try and map and and do do that in a very short short period of time to try and understand what the scale of food aid provision is in the UK. Yeah, yeah. And it quickly became clear that that's 
um, it's easy to get trust or trust data in the UK and the equivalent in, in other yeah. countries. But actually, it, food banks, as you know, food aid goes way beyond that. And it's very hard. There's lots of informal food aid often hidden um, or you know below the radar for, yeah. for obvious reasons. Um, so it's very, very hard to... Not so I, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely vital first step. Um, but I think just to add a note that it's um, one or two people have tried it and it is it is tricky. Um, but I agree, it's it's an important first step. Yeah. But it would be a very good demand to make. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure it's a demand that can be made. Cause it, and it has, it's yeah. realisable. And it has been done in a couple of other countries. So it's not as if yeah. this is something you've got to reinvent. And, and there is actually a, a module, you know, which actually addresses that question. You know. <laughs> so. Will these three go elegantly? Yeah. Go Thank you very much. Yeah. No yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The, uh, the, the question, can I ask a supplementary on your behalf? Yes. Um, can I ask a supplementary on your behalf? Mm -hmm. uh, Bye-bye. Um, uh, if the monitoring is so important, Canada and the US have got it, but still the welfare has declined into ill uh, Now you're ill talking fare. about that pretty, pretty question of political will. <laughs> And what that means. I, I don't disagree with you. No, 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 I, I know, I know. It, it, my point is, yeah. I thought... You and I think, I think I said you, you, you could have all this, you could have the entrenchment, you could have the data, look at the states, and still the problem is, 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 is critical. But I think without it, because you're not in a position to inform public policy. I mean, it, it's very clear. But there, then you need you know, other political forces to actually engage with the question. I mean, I... Uh, um, another book sort of going back in time, 1975, Change, Choice and Conflict in Social Policy, mm -hmm. written by Phoebe Hall and others. I mean, they, they looked at how issues be, uh, gained the priority attention of governments. And, the, you know, they looked at clean air, they looked at uh, the open university, they looked at family allowances. And I think it's a fascinating book to go back and look at because they talk about the, the kind of general criteria that has to be satisfied, you know, legi legitimacy, support, feasibility. So if you start thinking about food poverty in that light, and then issues have particular characteristics, you know, research, um, ideology, trends, and so on, knowledge. And of course, they, I mean, one of the points that they make very strongly in that book, it, 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 it's, you could satisfy all those criteria, but it isn't necessary that it's going to gain political traction. And one of the points they also make is that even though you have all the information, all the data in the world, it doesn't actually mean that this is going to occur. But the point is really about that is, is, is the perceptions that people have. So I think it, it, you know, the, these become political questions. You've got, to, you've got to have journalists who understand actually what these issues are about. I mean, I notice there's a school of journalism just down the road. I mean, do they, do they in, in, your, in, in your university just there, are they participating in this debate? You know, if we start talking about joined up food policy, where are the journalists? And then, you know, and polit because if they're not constructing this issue, you're not, you're not asking them to agree with you, but you're asking them to be informed about the issues. If they're not, then what kind of chance do we actually have of having a pub an informed public debate about the topics? And, and then, then there are the politicians, the ones who I kind of think, you know, should know better. Where are they? And, and I mean, you know, we have people on the left. I mean, when I went to Australia, when I taught in Australia in the early 1990s, um, the first food bank in Australia was opened in Melbourne, and it was opened by Hazel Hawke. And Hazel Hawke was the wife of, of Bob Hawke, who was the Labour Prime Minister of, Can of, of, of Australia. And I had to think, now, what is going on here? I mean, this is not something that a Labour politician should be participating in. I mean, I have a problem with Labour peer, you know, it always seems to me a kind of contradiction in terms of that's a peculiar UK phenomenon that's, I kind of, what's this all about? But, but um, so I think, anyway. I yeah. I yeah. Yeah. Let me try out an idea yeah. on you. Yeah. For me, the issue there is that actually the Labour of that period, the 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. let alone now, yeah. they've forgotten the 1930s. For those of you who know, he, he mentioned one golden name, Tennant. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have heard of him? Three, four. Yeah. 
you have to be able to find. Okay, 1975, all Introduction to Social mine, Policy. All ex students of mine who got to a certain yeah, point in the yeah, Masters yeah, of yeah. <coughs> they're made to read Tetanus. You have to read Tetanus. Clark, 1939, you, let you, alone you, in the war. You've got to, yeah. Because what yeah. we're talking about, what Graham yeah, is talking yeah, about, yeah, is yeah. A, a view of food as a right which came out of the experience from the 1920s and the 30s and was fought over in the 40s and then acted mm -hmm. and pushed through in the 50s and 60s. So when he refers to tetanus, he's referring to a shorthand yeah. mm. of that generation that left. Yeah. And we've forgotten it. And we've forgotten that's, it. And he was a man of the left. And Beveridge was, was a liberal. The five giants, you know, want, squalor, idleness. Forgotten them all. Um, ignorance. Ignorance oh. and... No, hunger was part of want, was yeah, part of poverty was and... So those, how many of you here know the beverage? Go and read it, because that yeah. is actually... <laughs> we've got to okay. read, well, you know? I'll, 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 I'll ask it, because we did. Everyone has to read uh, Beveridge's uh, uh, 1942 and all sorts of bits. Right? And read. Actually, the most important point yeah. there is Boydor. Yeah, yeah. Boydor sure. is yeah. the beverage of food yeah. poverty. Yeah. Boydor yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Victoria Williams from Food Matters. I've just got a couple of questions. One is, why is the, why is the left become so scared of talking about money and redistribution of, of wealth and so on? I mean, it just seems like that's not talked about at all. We, we're running scared politics. But I wanted to go back to the kind of um, counting, because you talked, uh, Dan talked about, you know, doing the, the review for DEFRA and, um, you know, it's really hard to find the data. You talked about America and Canada collecting that data. Were you talking about the numbers of people are using food banks or as when you no, talked in your talk about... No, the numbers of people about, are in food... So what a module, the measure? What, does, what is the, the measure It's part of the that that Canadian Community Health Survey and it's it administered regularly. Uh, someone may be here more familiar with it than I am, yeah? But they ask a series of questions okay. about do you worry about not being able to put food on the table? Do you make... Uh, does it make a difference whether you can put food on the table? Does it affect your food choices? Uh, are you not able to put food on the table? I mean, there, 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 there's, a, there's a, 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 a... That's nationally a, recognized. That's, that's actually recognized, and that is marker. us. That data is okay. collected, and it's, uh, yeah. So that, that, that I mean, it, it still misses populations, because in Canada, you know, if you're living on a reserve in northern Canada, sure. or you're Inuit or First Nations, you're going to be underrepresented, where, of course, incidents of food poverty yeah, are, are, are very great. Yeah, but I thought your point about the fact yeah. that, you know, it's 60% yeah. of people that are working poor are the ones that yeah, are using yeah, food banks, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Rebecca O'Connell from Thomas Corum Research Unit at the Institute of Education. Okay. Um, it was just a comment on the on the module because there's a you may know the, there's a survey that's due to be published in spring next year of um, an FAO survey which includes a short module, which is the Voices of the yeah. Hungry Project. Is it called that? I Somewhere. think I brought it. I think I've yeah, got a copy. I met, a, I met someone. Terry Ballard in, in, right, yeah. right, in, in Scotland who actually showed me because I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah. The UK I think there are 10 questions yeah. which actually are designed. To, That's yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that will include the UK. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's about 150 different countries. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We're trying at the moment to do some yeah. secondary analysis of and infer from yeah. the existing data sets sort of numbers yeah, of, okay. of, of families um, yeah. who are reporting food deprivation. Yeah, yeah, As you say, it's yeah, a yeah. challenge. Well, I'm, yeah. well, thank you. We're using a number of different data. So um, at the EU level, we're looking at um, the silk. Um, there's a, one of the years from the silk has um, a special um, material deprivation mm -hmm. module. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only one year, so then you're limited right. to looking at that right. rather than looking right. over time. Yeah. And the health behavior in school-aged children study. Yeah. Um, and then in the UK, we're doing second analysis of the PSE UK survey, mm -hmm. the Poverty and Social Exclusion UK study, okay. um, yeah. Yeah. Living Cost and Food survey yeah. that you yeah. Yeah. talked about and comparing that with the minimum income standard, mm -hmm. the food budget mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. part Can of I that. Ask you a question. Are you saying that to Graham um, because you think actually the data is there, the UK has No, I don't. <laughs> no. Or are you saying it's there but hasn't been collated? I'm saying it'll be interesting to when, the, when the, pub, the results are published in the spring from this new survey, but yeah. that we're it's a it's a I huge challenge at the moment the to try and yeah. make you know yeah. um, 
something of the data that do exist. Yeah. But those modules in themselves have quite a narrow definition mm -hmm. of, of, of household food yeah, insecurity. I mean that, yeah, I mean, I know there are debates yeah. about food insecurity from a so health sort of perspective or nutritional perspective, dietary perspective, and then food poverty indicators, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, which have broader definitions. But I, I think that, but I think the point does have to be made yeah. that the data isn't there, so that would be the pl place to start. And you, know? do you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Does anyone yeah. disagree with that? Well, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to hand it down to you? Yeah. Thank you. This, this wasn't a question. This was adding uh, a, a tiny bit of information in that the uh, FSA-funded uh, survey that's run every two years called, with the rather distressing name of Food and You, um, Food and you. It's, it's just published its um, preliminary analysis of the third wave mm -hmm. uh, data uh, that they published last week or the week before. Uh -huh. And that, that's got one or two questions about whether or not people have changed their purchase, food purchasing habits right. in because they've, they've become short of money. Yeah. I mean, it's tiny and it isn't, yeah. it isn't yeah. at all yeah. um, adequate in even yeah. trying to address food yeah. Secu yeah. Uh, insecurity yeah. and measure yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but there is that tiny hint in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there. I'm I'm not an academic by any stretch of the imagination, um, but uh, my name is Vera. Um, I'm from the Brighton and Hope Food Partnership. Um, I work on food waste reduction um, and educa education, but we do have a, a project officer who's been doing work around food poverty locally. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, I volunteer for a couple of different projects that, um, that address surplus food in the city uh, and work with food poverty charities. So I really, I came along to understand sort of what's my role, what's our role in this. Um, and much of what you said has really resonated with me. But I guess my question is, um, because as you've pointed out, um, this issue really galvanizes communities and the first response that communities have are like, we know our neighbors are starving, let's start a food bank. Mm -hmm. So there's a real like power to this, so there are there. Um, I do agree that it's not the solution, in fact we need to figure out how not to have food banks. Um, but there's also lots of other projects that are not food banks, so like lunch clubs, yes, um, other, yeah, other yeah, projects yeah, that really bring yeah. people together, might be the only hot meal mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. that week. Mm -hmm. So really, okay, so yes, it's here and wow, we have so many volunteers volunteers that are willing to give up their time. So what do we do with this? How do we, so what is our role now? Um, perhaps, can we be, in this kind of joined up effort, can we be feeding into perhaps better local pictures of food insecurity? Um, and what is our role perhaps politically as we get together around surplus food and helping our neighbors in need? So that, that's kind of my question. I know, I know we're part of this, but what do we do? Um. Well, I, th I, th I think there are, there are different things that one can do. I mean, I, 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 think, I think one of the points that I would make most strongly is that there are, as you say, many groups working in the community in terms of community gardens, collective kitchens, community agriculture. Well, there are in, certainly in North America and in Canada, and I assume that's the, it's the case here. Uh, <laughs> and community meal programs that, you, that you've talked about. And there are agencies where, where people, you know, where homeless people might be living who do not have actually steady supplies of food. And my, um, I think sort of my response to that is, well, why are these agencies actually not being funded? Why are they not being supported by local government or by the government so that they can purchase the food, purchase, you know, what is actually needed. I mean, and I don't know, from just from an economic perspective, wouldn't that actually be more beneficial because you're actually beginning to put sort of money into the food market. You're actually, you know, you're, you're, you're supporting sort of, you know, you're, 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 buy, you're, you're helping farmers, you're helping, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the local food market. So if you ask me, well, what do we do politically, that would be an argument that I, I would take forward. I mean, I have another argument about it. I mean, and it, it always seems to me that perhaps every time someone gives 
a can or whatever to a food bank, they should also be tweeting or sending a message to their local politicians saying, I've done this, what are you doing? You know, asking that question. I mean, I, I think that it, it's about sort of raising awareness about the question, about the issue. And the other, the, the other thing I would just say about volunteering, in Ontario, there is an organization called Freedom 90, okay? Now, I don't know whether you w aware, but in, but in North America, there's a very big corporate uh, international insurance company called Manu Life. And Manu Life has a program that's called Freedom 55, right? So if you're a dual income family <laughs> and you're earning good money and you've um, invested in your mutual funds and maybe hedge funds and whatever, and you do this well and you're, you're really committed to the work ethic and so on and so forth, you can retire when you're 55. Freedom 90 in Ontario is a play on that. These are actually people who volunteered in the food bank when they retired. And now, 20, 30 years later, they've actually formed a union. It's a union of food bank volunteers. And they're wishing to retire before they're 90 years of age. They are fed up with what they've been doing over all this time. So, I don't know. I think it's a wonderful sort of political response. And it, you know, it has traction. I mean, people understand because not every food, I mean, actually when I wrote my first book, I was invited to join the board of the, of, of the Regina Food Bank in Saskatchewan. So I really had to think about that. And, but I actually met, I, I went and talked to one of the older statesmen sort of on the food bank board who'd been a farmer in Saskatchewan in the 1930s, right? So he remembered the Great Depression. He'd gone to world, he'd fought in World War II. They came back. They decided, you know, as in Britain, they wanted a new society. They wanted a, 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 to build a, a new society. And he said he never thought then that he would see the day again when bread lines, you know, and, and, and food banks would actually be in that city. So I, I mean, I think I learned from that that actually on, within food banks and on food banks, there's a range of opinion about why people are there. And, and people do actually understand this you know, in, in a political context. So we from the univer I mean, I did join the board, and we actually, between the, 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 um, the food bank and our research unit at the university, we did some very interesting work on child hunger. We, you know, we, we, we revealed it, we made it clear in the community. We had this right-wing government that I was talking about. So we went to the city hall, which, which had a sort of slightly centrist leftist government. We gave them our data. They didn't have any constitutional responsibility for doing anything about that. But they actually negotiated with the government, you know, with, and we actually got school meals, you know, up and running in the community. Okay, it's not the revolution, but it, 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 was, it actually did make a difference. So I think there are all kinds of possibilities. I actually sometimes think that food banks are very, um, they're very reticent to become quotes unquote political, but I actually think if they were to, they might actually end up with more food being contributed than if they actually stay silent. Because I think people, people do understand the complexities and contradictions. About yeah, it's about the, yeah, yeah, about yeah, the yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, well, Look, yeah. we have, a, no, this is green stuff. We yeah. have actually four questions. Okay, so wow. So why don't you, you're doing what I do, giving very long answers. Yeah, I'm sorry, which, we, yeah, which I shouldn't be, okay. All four Two words. No, because I'll forget the first yeah. one. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll give Short yeah, questions, yeah, yeah. quick answer from I'll there. I'll do a yes and no question then. Um, Ruth Sirocco, I'm an alumni of City University. Just wanted to ask you a you little bit. Can you speak into Sorry, the mic? just yeah. wanted to understand a little bit more about the, the egg and chicken thing here. Do you think that the food poverty, um, food bank response is um, an issue of food poverty and the community responding and industry responding and then taking care of, of food waste for them? Or is it actually, and then sort of government saying, now we don't need to deal with it because community and industry are doing it for us? Or is it actually started with government saying, we're not taking care of it, and then response from society and industry? Well, I don't think government actually said they're not taking care of it. I think government actually has a whole set of policies uh, through welfare reform and workfare really designed to get people back in, into, the, into the labor force. And they see that the way to do this is really the application of that old principle of less eligibility, of actually 
you know, keeping wages low, actually keeping benefits low to actually force people back. I don't think they had a conception about whether people were going hungry or not. But so is this answering your question? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I don't think that, um, and I think the community response actually came. I think that's initially. Interestingly, the, the first food bank in, um, in the States, my understanding is that uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, wasn't actually about feeding hungry people. It was actually about recycling. It was about recycling food waste. I thought and I'm going to answer this question for you. Yeah. I thought the picture of the saint who was going around, I think genuinely yeah, yeah, to come yeah. next, was at a point, and there were two people who were waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Graham, I'm probably picking up on a, um, your previous answer. I did want to know if, in your view, public procurement, where governments are sourcing local foods from local farmers for school meals, for prisons, for hospitals. Is that on the same continuum as government support for food banks? Or is it a different beast? I, th I think it's a somewhat, a quick answer, I think it's a somewhat different beat, actually, yeah. Uh, hello, um, I'm Hannah Robeson. I'm a PhD student at SOAS. Um, but towards the end of your talk, you s mentioned localism as one of the dangers of a sort of am Americanization, uh, neoliberalization of welfare. Um, and then you then expressed quite a lot of optimism about things that happened at the local level in Canada and in Scotland. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the role of localism or the local and yeah, how it I can be kind of I harnessed. Would, I could have been a bit misleading there. I, mean, I was thinking about localism sort of driving things back to the, the level of the parish, right, in, in small communities. I also, I, maybe I've sort of talked about localism as well in terms of provincial governments and, 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 and autonomy, which I suppose is not, not that form of localism. I mean, it's a part of, it, it's a part of um, federal systems and, and uh, uh, where certain powers are, you know, devolved to provincial levels of government, as in Canada, where, you know, where the provinces have constitutional authority over health, education, social welfare. Although it's actually a bit more complicated than that, because although, you know, we would pay tax, you know, at the provincial level you pay taxes, and at the federal level you pay taxes, there is also what is called equalization payments that are made by the federal government because provinces vary in size. I mean, there's a, you know, so you have Ontario, which has got about, I don't know, 10, 12 million people living there, which is a province, and you have Prince Edward Island, which is tiny with about 300,000. So there, there has to be certain, certain compensations, and some provinces are doing well financially and others are not. Uh, so at the end of the day, the federal government has over, overall power, but there's, there are high degrees of, 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 uh, of, of autonomy. That, that, that are unconstitutional autonomy for these matters. So that's what I meant. That, but in, the, in, the, in those kind of federal structures, there is opportunity for politicians, if they want to take the bull by the horns, to actually you know, create new agendas. Yeah, that, that's really the point I was making. Yeah. And Quebec, of course, is, is a very interesting example of that because it's, it has a different political culture. It's different you know, and because it's long-term historical quest for independence. It actually... It's actually, it's, its provincial parliament is called the National Assembly. So, it, 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 you know, the, the use of those words and those terms, they, uh, I, I think, give to people a different sense of power and the opportunities and capacities for, for actually doing things, you know. I think uh, yeah. I, I was glad you asked that question yeah. because I too know that that's also that you need a very rounded thinker to conceive. Um, I, I thought you used the word localism in different ways, yeah. Uh, yeah. partly as a pressure if you're yeah. student of tickets. Just yeah. Going to read tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that tr incredible tradition of the British yeah. welfare system, yeah. Elizabethan, yeah. The Tudor, yeah, 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 Elizabethan, absolute Paulus. oppression yeah. at the local level, yeah. ruthless authoritarian yeah. poverty yeah. oppression. Yeah. And then in the 19th century, another version of it, and yeah. he was yeah. posing yeah. the thought yeah. as a student of Tibbs and saying, "My goodness, is this going back to that?" So that. People in a rich area have a better food bank than people in a poor area. 
and there, yeah, and there are all sorts of issues in relationship to that because if you have people in local communities making decisions about whether you get food or not, people in local communities know each other. I mean, I've just moved to a small community of 8,000 people on the east coast of Vancouver Island, and I can tell you, I mean, we've only been there about two years, and you begin to know everybody, and then you, then you would have to start thinking, you know, if I'm responsible for ensuring this person is going to get food or not, and I know all kinds of things about them. Titmus's question would be, of course, why give to strangers? Why give to strangers? And that's the basis for national sort of collective action and making appropriate moral... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The thing that yeah. civilised Britain was the institutionalisation of a gift relationship. Yeah. Patrick Butler from The Guardian. Mm -hmm. uh, Graham, thanks. That was a, a, fa mm -hmm. a fantastic lecture, very interesting. And, and yes, an interesting point about whether journalists understand food poverty. Mm -hmm. and, and ironically, I think that we've only begun to understand food poverty to even know that it exists in a way because of yeah. food banks and because mm -hmm. of the growth of food banks yeah. in UK. And it's become sort of a mechanism by which uh, a media which is generally very much out of touch from what's happening at you know poverty level uh it's a way of them understanding what's mm -hmm. going on down there and in some ways it's become an icon of austerity so mm. in some ways you know food banks ironically are you know helping us understand the effects of, mm -hmm. uh, of austerity my question is do you think that there is any role at all for food banks I understand that, that you know you, you believe there are there are limits and we shouldn't rely on them too much. But do you think there is a role somewhere? I suppose, having watched this developments over a sort of a long period, I've come to the conclusion that there isn't a role for them. That uh, I think if we uh, and if we take them out of the equation, we can then begin to get to grips with the kinds of questions that we you know, that, that, w that we need to address. I mean, if they're not going to be there to, um, you know, permit food waste from the food retailing sector or, the, you know, the, 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 the food production system, I mean, there's an area that I know little about. What kind of questions does that then sort of, you know, raise for the food system and for the, for the production of food? And I suppose it may be, I suppose you could begin to say, well, it's going to, result in sort of rising prices, et cetera. But then I think, you know, the societies, you know, in Scandinavia or sort of Norway where there are high standards of living, you then have to start thinking about that in the context of rates of taxation as well to, to, to you know, you, you, you have better opportunities to raise the revenues necessary to, to support this, this, this system of collective welfare. Um, we I mean, I, I can tell you that I think that people in Canada, I'm a persona non grata in relationship to, to food banking in Canada because I'm seen to have a very different view because I, I do fundamentally believe that people should have that money in their pocket so that they can make in their, their own choices about what they're going to eat and what they're going to buy and that that's a, a fundamental principle of human rights and to be on the receiving end of charity is not somewhere that you would want to be. And if you do interviews and discussions with people, yes, you're going to find people who will say they're very grateful for what they've received, but you're going to find many people who will not go there, who do not see this as an appropriate approach. But to get back, I mean, just to sort of carry that forward, of course there are people who are not able to feed themselves. I mean, if they had all the money in the world, they wouldn't actually know how to do that. But I, I think then, that, that then there's another question, you know, for the state. Well, if they're requiring uh, meal programs, if they're, if they're living in institutions where this is, uh, which actually are having to source their food from food banks, those agencies should be funded so that the food market can operate appropriately. I don't believe that we need secondary food markets for certain kinds of people. I think that's an, you know, that's a, an abuse of their human rights. Yeah. 
Graham's point about the, the need to take more time to talk to people like you, the food bank's narrative has been a particular narrative. Uh, in Britain, they're new. They're not that new, but they're, they're new relatively compared yeah. to Canada yeah, yeah. or Australia. Yeah, or oh, New and Zealand. This is the third or, yeah. world, yeah. as we used to call yeah. it, experiment brought back to the States first, then into Canada and Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're actually a very good writer about this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Do you feel lonely about it? Who <laughs> <laughs> banks generous support group? Yeah. I don't mean that lightly. I think it, yeah, I think it's a problem. I think if uh, the Guardian is always going to cover these issues because it's the Guardian, yeah. the Independent will maybe, the rest of the media not really interested, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe once a year, Trussell Trust will do its annual audit and it will be a story, but um, uh, yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's fairly lonely. Um, the interesting thing about the international comparisons is uh, that on one level you can argue, look, if we're not careful, the UK will become Americanized, as Graham said. You know, look at the American system, look at the Canadian system, do we really want this? And interestingly, I've noticed that right-wing politicians will actually turn that round and say, well, look, it's normal. Even Germany, even Finland, the Nordic countries, the social democracies, even they have food banks. Therefore, it's entirely normal. So you know, this is a really interesting ongoing debate. And I think the trick for journalists is to understand how we can kind of report this as news as opposed sure, to uh, sure. you know, writing about interesting issues. See, I think the interesting question would be to have a conversation with Oliver Letwin yeah, and indeed. because I, I, I'm just sort of thinking back to when he was there and when some of us were wondering whether this was a kind of, they were testing things out in the colonies. They were, you know, and now this is actually what they've got. So, I mean, he can stand there and say, well, they've got it in Canada and they've got it in the United States. Well, they've got it in Canada. I mean, I went there. This is, this, is the, this is exactly the result of, you know, what I was advising them. This is, this is what we should be having here. But there's, but there's a paradox because uh, it's, it's incredibly difficult to get a right way, a conservative politician to talk about food banks. You know, in some ways, it's the ultimate crystallization of the big society. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everything oh, oh, exactly. they wanted Absolutely. it to be. Yeah. But will they talk about it? No, because it's still embarrassing for them. They know that if they talk about food banks, they'll be you know, hammered in prime minister's question time. So, what, so what's the left saying about food banks? It's I mean, because that's a more interesting deeply, question to deeply me. Deeply ambivalent. Uh, it is. They're ambivalent because of the question about charities of... They're ambivalent because, I'm, I, you know, I've spoken to Labour politicians about this, and, and uh, on one level they absolutely see the intellectual argument against yeah, food yeah, banks and yeah. how in this day and age, in this yeah. society, yeah, yeah. sixth richest country, they see that absolutely. But there's also the part of them that gets wistful for this kind of collective action, that the community, you know, kind of communitarian, the community doing things for itself. And it, it kind of takes them back to a kind of a mythical golden age of labor when, yeah. you know, there was that kind of collective community spirit. So they, you know, they are deeply ambivalent yeah. about the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. They acknowledge it that they exist and they're needed. It's, it does all come back to money. I mean, that's what we've the underlying thing is that people need more money, and no one wants to talk about money. No one wants to talk about putting taxes up, or so no one wants to talk about it. it Actually, seems. I had a in between 1971 and 1974, I was uh, director of the Liverpool University Settlement in Toxton, and it was a time when. People in community work uh, began to sort of go back to actually live in and work in 
areas like Toxteth, sort of deprived neighborhoods and sort of low-income areas. And the attraction of the old settlement houses was that there was a plant, there were buildings, there was a connection to universities, there, there, was, there was all this sort of old noblesse oblige, you know, the, the, of, the, of the charity model. Some of them had money, but they also had a lot of ideas, and they were uh, sort of wonderful places to be. And in Liverpool, um, one of the things that we did, I mean, we, well, we kind of opened the doors to the community. We let young people from the neighborhood who uh, actually wanted to leave home, but they weren't middle class, they didn't have education, they didn't have income, so that came, became a place for them to stay. We had, we had sort of youth clubs, but we had literacy programs, we had welfare rights programs, we had new careers programs. But the interesting thing, and I was thinking about this the other day, we also had an industrial development project because unemployment was a, was a, was a crucial issue. We actually had coming to work with us uh, a, a kind of a junior middle, sort of middle management executive from IBM. And he actually came and worked with us for a year in terms of helping this project move along, in terms of creating employment in the neighborhood. And um, we were taking double-decker buses and turning them into play buses. I mean, there, a whole lot of different things were happening. And, you know, I was thinking the other day that, so we, now we've got the corporations, I mean, they're kind of wanting to run these charities. If they, if they really, if this neoliberal sort of mantra about work is the only social policy that, that actually matters, why aren't they sending their executives and the people who are presumably meant to know about how you create business, how you, you know, uh, share your skills, your knowledge, into these neighborhoods to uh, do this kind of work. I mean, I, ra rather, than, rather than try and pretend that they're doing something noble through corporate social responsibility, why don't they put their feet on the ground and actually go and do it where it matters? And because I do remember way back, we tried to get money from Rothschild, actually, you know, for some of our projects. And I can actually remember sitting in that boardroom in Rothschilds in the city somewhere. I mean, if they'd sold the table, it would have, it would have kept us going for about 20 years. <laughs> and I remember, I don't know which Rothschild it was, was, but it was one of them. He said, I have no responsibility for the problems that you're facing in Liverpool. And I thought, oh, well, you know, we didn't get any money from them that day. They wouldn't but say that now. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say, say that now. Well, then they need they, to send their... Their language would be their, much softer. Yeah, they yeah. need to send their, yeah. their, their skilled people to actually, yeah. into these communities to actually do what they profess is what the answer is to the question. Yeah? But Look, anyway. uh, this has been a very, very good session. Did you want to come in? We'll give the last, the other journalists yeah. another go. Come on. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Wells, um, former journalist. I'm a PhD student here. I just wanted to say that um, Martin Carraher, Professor Martin Carraher, and I have done some work on food banks in the media. Uh -huh. um, and just to say that one of the things that came out of that work that we did was looking at this question of data that I think is really interesting, that a lot of the data seemed to come from the Trussell Trust. Um, and that was driving the newspaper coverage or the media coverage of yeah. it. And so there's no independent, or there's no data mm -hmm. from an mm -hmm. independent, more independent yeah. source. Um, and also the voice, I think, of the, the, the people using the food banks was very often absent from that coverage. Sure, yeah. Um, so th and there were several other issues that yeah, came up. I, but, um, yeah. I think so Martin and I are having lunch tomorrow, but I suppose basically I would distrust data from the food banks. You know, it's kind of... Sorry? I think the Chuck Adams one is one of some of the Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, well, I, I won't embarrass Rebecca, but she was a producer on the food programme. Oh. Who, uh, yeah. And the food programme from very early days, from Derek, before your time. Mm -hmm. Derek Cooper was always covering this. It was, it's actually been the media voice on food poverty in Britain with the longest oh, really? route, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, a, a very honourable role, actually. Um, look, I, I think we could go on, but actually we're going to be booted out in five minutes anyway. But I think we should thank Graham very, very warmly and strongly that uh, it was an incredibly elegant lecture, but most importantly, it raises lots, as our discussion has shown, lots of really difficult issues, actually. Yeah. Yeah. We are where we are mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. food poverty and social policy. Um, but there is some really good learning to have 
uh, and you've posed lots of questions that where academics can help civil society, but you kept on saying, rightly, in my humble opinion, look, this isn't something either academics or civil society can sort out, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what they've got to be clear about is where they're going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and which direction do they want to push in as right. opposed right. to collude in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. in a yeah. very simple yeah. way yeah. what I understand. And yeah. some of the big yeah. questions about... Um, food poverty, it's not just an issue of food poverty. Yeah, it's sure. about what yeah. sort of society do you think is a civilized society? Yeah. It yeah. Gets, that's yeah. why he's referring yeah. to the titmuses and the beverages, yeah. Yeah. because they, it was that moment of history in Britain and indeed in the Western world yeah. where they started really having to engage with that big, 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 that big policy question. What's a good society? What's a good food system? What's social justice? Yeah. And then now it's all, what does my iPod give me? Yeah. Or my, yeah. can I get a telephone yeah. at the right price? It's a consumer. The one thing you didn't say was uh, within the neoliberal ethos is consumerism. Uh -huh. to, who was there to ask the question of what could be, is there anything good out of food banks? I think if there is anything good out of food banks, it's an anti-consumerist ethos. It's actually going out beyond yourself. It's a recognition of the other mm -hmm. at a very important level, I think. Although I'm, I'm a but critic is it, of food is banks. It, is it a critical or uncritical solidarity? Uh, that's the that's issue. That's the question. I think that is the issue. I absolutely <laughs> yeah. agree. Yeah. Tina, yeah. let's give the last word to Tina. Yeah. Do you want to have a, a last word? Because here you are. You've been patently listening as your yeah. co-editor yeah. takes yeah. the fun. You don't have to. Why not? You're no. from Finland. Well, that's Come to the front. Always give Finland the line. Yeah. I, 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 I wasn't pre prepared at all, but uh, anyway, uh, for me, as a younger colleague, um, it has been a great pleasure to work with Graham. We had a really wonderful cooperation, and uh, I have learned so much. So much about editing a book, so much English language and so much about food banks and food charity all around the world, basically. And um, well, if I have to say something about Finland, it is that uh, Finland is really the only Nordic country uh, which is uh, having such a, a large scale institutionalized uh, food aid based on charity. There's no in Sweden, not in Denmark, not in Norway. For sure. So uh, I'm not very proud of that development in my own country. But uh, on the other side, not to be too harsh, I have to say that uh, we still have pretty much um, left of those uh, Nordic welfare um, kind of principles we have been committed to. And um, well, to listen, Graham and team, it's, uh, when I go back, I, I know that I have to work hard to keep it as it is and maybe to make it stronger. So, thank you very much.